Hi. Good evening, everyone, from uh, still sunny Chicago, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm uh, Filippo Lancieri, a postdoctoral fellow at the ETH Zurich Center for Law and Economics, and a research fellow here at the Stigler Center. Tonight, we're happy to host a conversation between Congressman Ken Buck and Professor Nancy Rose. And I think it's very important to have Congressman Ken Buck here. I think we're very happy indeed, because I don't think it's unfair to describe the US antitrust laws over many years as, a, as Congress expand, passing new laws to expand enforcement, and then the judiciary kind of cutting down enforcement and trimming down a little bit. So any discussion on the future of antitrust policy needs to include a discussion on the future of, of new laws and how Congress is view, viewing and acting on them. So before we begin, please note that we are on the record and live streaming, and uh, we will post the video on the Stigler Center YouTube channel later. If you have questions for the speakers, we will address them in the last 20 minutes or so. And as usual, the views expressed by guests are their own and not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. And finally, we hope that you will join us for more upcoming events, so please check our website for more details, as well as the Stigler Center's publication, promarket.org, and the Capitalism Podcast. Now, please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Congressman Ken Buck is a Republican representing Colorado's 4th Congressional District. He was first elected to Congress in 2014 and is currently serving his fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. He serves on the House Judiciary and Foreign Affairs Committee as the ranking member of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial and Administrative Law, and also on the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship, as well as the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Non-Proliferation. That's a lot of subcommittees. <laughs> Uh, after law school, he worked for Congressman Dick Cheney on the Iran Contra investigation and then became a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice. And in 1990, he joined the Colorado U.S. Attorney Office, uh, where he became the chief of the criminal division. And among others, he also served as the business executive and Weld County District Attorney three times. Professor Nancy Rose is the Charles P. Klindelberger Professor of Applied Economics at MIT. She's also the Martina S. Horner Distinguished Visiting Professor at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Her research and teaching focus on industrial organization, competition policy, and the economics of regulation. Professor Rose has previously served at the Economics Department Head at MIT as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economic Analysis in the Antitrust Division of the DOJ and Director of the National Bureau of Economic Research Program on in Industrial Organization from its creation in 1991 until her appointment to the DOJ in 2014. Now, without further ado, I turn over to our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy and Congressman. Thank you. This is my chance? Okay. Good evening. So, thank you. The first time I came in uh, contact with the concept of antitrust was my third year of law school. We were given a sheet of electives and uh, the first one at the top of the list was antitrust, and I thought to myself, I am never going to use that, so I'm not going to take that class. <laughs> and here I am. Um, I, I want to, I'm asked uh, a, a lot, and I hope I don't take your first question away from you here, but I'm asked a lot, why, why are you so interested in antitrust? Why, why is a Republican, why is a redneck from Colorado uh, interested in this area? And I want to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about why I think this uh, issue is resonating in, in America. Um, I started out uh, life with a lot of energy, and my parents decided that they needed to put boundaries around me. Um, we call that child abuse nowadays. Um, in, in, uh, in the old days, they called that parenting. And so um, they actually, uh, when I was 12 years old, they sent me out to my aunt and uncle's ranch in Wyoming. And I, I learned something interesting, that uh, in order to keep steers, cattle away from the uh, barbed wire fence, they'd put an electric fence around the, the field. And if you're 14 years old, uh, you don't want to walk a half mile to figure out whether the electric fence is on. You just go up and you reach and you and you figure out that it's a hot fence. Um, I don't, I don't know how many of you remember Will Rogers, but Will Rogers said that uh, men, not women, but men learn in three ways. One man will read, a few men will observe, and the rest of us have to pee on an electric fence to understand what's going on. <laughs> the, uh, and so I had this sort of uh, uh, psychotic life where I, I spent half of my life uh, the school year in New York, 
and the other uh, part in, uh, in Wyoming working on this ranch. And, and in New York, I, um, I lived in a town, I don't know how many of you, anybody from New York here? You ever hear of getting sent up the river to Sing Sing Prison? Well, that's, that's where I lived, was, was uh, the town where Sing Sing Prison was. And so I had a great example of boundaries um, in my hometown. I could just look at the walls and, and see uh, Sing Sing Prison. People ask me, um, I give tours of the Capitol at night, and people ask me why I'm so uh, you know, comfortable in Congress. And I said, I grew up around prisoners. I, I grew up around crooks and uh, lobbyists and, and criminals and, and congressmen are you know, something I'm comfortable with. So I, I, uh, I went from that kind of boundary and then I played football in college and, and you know, you have the ball and you step out of bounds, the play is over. If you grab someone's face mask, there's a flag. There's, there's boundaries in that world. And then the best part was I was a prosecutor. Best job in the world. Mr. Smith, I know that you're the president of the local Rotary Club, but this is your second DUI and you are gonna to go to jail for 30 days. Do you have time to, to gather your belongings? Certainly. Uh, you have three seconds because the gentleman behind you with the handcuffs is gonna escort you to prison. And I, I sort of felt like I was a real estate agent. I was giving people a home, a place to live. <laughs> and and it, was, it was a gated community. And, and the really cool thing about the gated community was it was uh, an all-inclusive resort. So the meals were included, and, and also uh, you didn't have to pay extra for the athletic facilities. They were also included in that. So that was sort of my upbringing. And then I go to, is Brooke here? Did I see Brooke? Right oh, right in front of me, okay. Brooke went to the University of Colorado. So we had a hearing, I'm fast forwarding now a little bit, at the University of Colorado. And, and it, was, it was fascinating to me because w w in, in Colorado, we refer to Boulder, Colorado as the People's Republic of Boulder. And, and it's really kind of generous because I would suggest that it's part of this planet. It's really not part of this planet. It, it belongs in a separate universe. But they have this uh, place called the Pearl Street Mall. And, and you see these kids walking up and down with these signs saying, you know, uh, we need better air quality. We need better air quality. Meanwhile, they have a joint in their mouth. And there is this smoke, this haze above the Pearl Street Mall while they're protesting about uh, air quality. It just, a lot of the things in Boulder don't make sense. I was not excited to go to Boulder, Colorado to this hearing, but I went to the hearing in, in Boulder, Colorado. And um, the, my whole background of boundaries just sort of came out at, at that point in time. I'm listening to uh, these, these innovators, these, these people who we're so proud of in this country. The, the, the only way that we are going to succeed in this country um, is if we out-innovate the rest of the world. We are not going to have lower labor costs. We're not going to have lower energy costs. We have to out-innovate. So I'm listening to these innovators, and, and they're telling story after story about how they get crushed by Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Um, you know, my favorite <laughs> company called Genius, um, music lyrics, and, and Google just takes their music lyrics and throws them on Google. I mean, word for word. And, and so Genius decides, well, we have to make sure they're doing this. So they put a watermark in the lyrics, red-handed. Isn't that great? Caught, like caught red-handed, but red-handed. And it was, it was Morse code with, uh, you know, commas and semicolons. And... Sure enough, red-handed appears in the lyrics. And, and uh, actually, Genius lost their lawsuit because they didn't own the copyright. They just did all the work, but they didn't own the copyright. But Google thought nothing of taking that and putting it on. And as a prosecutor, I'm thinking, that's, that's just not right. Something doesn't, doesn't feel right about that. And then you got uh, you know, Spotify. Spotify is competing with Apple Music, and Apple Music charges a 30% surcharge for any company that has a competitive product. Not If you don't have a competitive product, you don't get the surcharge, just if you have a competitive product. And then you have these, you know, Tile. Tile has this little chip that you can put in and you can find your, your phone or your wallet or your luggage or whatever. And what do you know? But Apple has a competitive product and for some reason, for two weeks, when Apple introduces its competitive product, the software doesn't match anymore with Tile. 
You know, it was just one story after another like that, and it, it, it just bothered me. So I, I started to explore a little bit. And uh, the, the last time Congress really dealt with antitrust in, in a meaningful way was 1890, the Sherman Act, and 1914, the Clayton Act. And what was going on in the country right then it was interesting. It's just it's post-Civil War. We are in industrializing at a rapid rate. We're uh, moving west uh, in, in the frontier. There's all this upheaval in this country. And some really, really smart people figured out how to take advantage of all that upheaval and create monopolies that were pr practically in impregnable. And, and so I go to this hearing in Boulder, Colorado, um, as a free market guy, the market's going to take care of this. I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't, I don't you know, I Googled, but but didn't seem like it harmed me any. And so I started looking into this, and we are in a very similar point in our country's history with the technology and, and the, the revolution going on with, with high tech that we were during the, the 1890s to probably the 1870s to, to 1910, 1920. And, and something has to be done. And here's really the issue that, that grabbed me, and, and I think grabs a whole lot of people out there. And that is, if you control the flow of information in, the, in a democracy, you control elections. And that's what's so scary. If it would be one thing if we had a monopoly with airlines or banks or uh, pharma or, or some other group, that's, that's bad, we've got to deal with it, hopefully the enforcers take that seriously. But to have a monopoly on the, on the flow of information, it, it threatens us. And I think that's one thing that, that uh, liberals and conservatives agree on right now. And it's one thing, it may not be articulated in, in an academic sense by people in this country, but they feel it in their gut. They feel in their gut that something is wrong and something is amiss, something that they can't get their hands around, and it scares them. It doesn't scare them because they're hurting right now because of what big tech is doing. It scares them because of the change that's possible uh, in the future. And I think when you look at the, the uh, Boston Tea Party, uh, you know, the, the, the taxation without representation idea. I hope there's no Brits in here, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. We, we threw a little tea overboard in Boston, and I didn't have much of a sense of humor about it. But, but that was about a monopoly, the East India Company, and it was about the, the threat that had occurred in India and, and the, the famine that was caused um, and the, the million people who died in India. And, and the colonists at that point looked at that and said, we are not going to allow something like that to happen in this country. And that's what I believe the revolution was about, and it took off in so many ways. And, and our, our founders, Thomas Jefferson, wrote to James Madison and said, I want a provision in the Bill of Rights that prohibits monopolies. James Madison wrote back and said, that's crazy. We're never going to have monopolies in this country. We set this whole country up in a way that we're not going to allow that kind of, of accumulation of wealth. And uh, the, the result is, uh, I think, a, a thread that uh, goes through the, um, really the culture in this country from the time we were founded to now, and that is a fear of uh, some people having too much power. We, we've got a system that protects us, not perfectly, but protects us uh, from the government uh, uh, overreach, from the government infringing on our rights. We don't have a system that protects us with uh, big accumulations of wealth unless we empower the antitrust system. And that's why I think people are coming together right now across the political spectrum, and they're looking for answers and they're looking for leadership, frankly, on, on these questions. So with that, I will sit down and get grilled. So, so Ken, I'm thrilled that we have much in common, not only our interest in, in competition policy, um, but our um, rural agrarian roots. Um, I will say, a apropos your, your gender distinction, um, while I looked at those electric fences around my grandparents' dairy farm and wondered if they were live, I, I just wondered. I didn't test, so, <laughs> so maybe there is something. That's why you're a professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so maybe let's, 
let's start by, um, uh, there's a lot in what you've said. Let, let, let's um, maybe start by thinking about what's going on in Congress right now, and in particular many of the bills that, that you've co-sponsored that are very focused on tech. And I take your point that you see what's happening in the big tech space, especially with the big four or five companies, depending on how we count them, um, uh, as being a kind of not just market threat, but a, a threat to the democratic institutions that we've got. Um, but that said, you know, perhaps part of what has allowed those companies to accumulate the kind of market power and market dominance that they have is uh, an inadequacy in our competition policy enforcement system. And so I'd, I'd love to hear more from you about you know, um, what you think about should, should the legislation that maybe we're at this inflection point where we actually could see Congress adopting new laws, should that focus as heavily as it does on, the, on these kind of small handful of companies and the problems in that space? Um, how do you think about maybe opening up to kind of broader antitrust policy reform? Well, let me, let me start with uh, tech, if I can. Uh, I, I think the, the biggest issue that we've had is Congress has done nothing. We haven't used our Article I authority to, uh, to legislate. And the result is that the courts have stepped in and, and filled that void. The, the problem, and, and, and as a, a, a litigator for 25, 30 years, the problem with the courts dealing with this issue is they only can deal with the facts before them. They can't deal with a broader uh, social and economic policy uh, like the legislative branch can. And so um, we, have, we started with this concept uh, of the consumer welfare standard years ago. And, and it kept getting more and more narrow. And it got more and more narrow to the point, I believe, where the enforcers became risk averse. They knew if they went to court and they couldn't show a price change, they were gonna get beat, and so they didn't go to court. We had a decade of uh, huge accumulation in the, in the big tech area. Um, I think we need to address that before we move on to other areas. Um, are there other areas that are, are ripe? Absolutely. Um, are they? Uh, do, they, do they pale by comparison? In my view, they do. And if we can't get uh, uh, meaningful legislation passed concerning big tech, we're never going to get meaningful legislation passed politically uh, regarding other industries. And, and what do you think the odds are for meaningful legislation, even if we just restrict it to the tech space? Um, I, I believe that we will pass three bills, uh, significant bills, by the August recess, which is uh, towards the end of July. And, and which, which of this, you know, you've got a, a, a number that you've been involved with, which of that panoply of bills do you think have the best chance? So um, the, the one bill that's, that uh, will move forward, um, it's in what we call the Competes Act right now, um, language that has been agreed to by the uh, House side and the, the Senate side, um, and that is a, a bill that will um, give more resources to the FTC and uh, the antitrust division. Uh, so that bill, that, that's number one, and, that, and that's probably the easiest bill because um, uh, I heard Jonathan was here earlier and, and talked about the fact that uh, they have less real resources now than they had a decade, two decades ago. So um, clearly there needs to be something done in, in that area. Uh, the second bill is, is a bill that the Attorney General, the State Attorney General came to me with and asked me to run and I ran it. and. Uh, Chairman Cicilline and, and others were uh, uh, good enough to help me uh, get that bill, uh, as a, a member of the minority, get that bill uh, in, uh, in shape and, and get it moving. And, and that is a bill that gives the state attorney generals the same venue um, uh, uh, privilege as uh, the federal government. And so that, that's an, uh, under the Clayton Act. That's, that's an important bill. Um, but the third bill is really the, the, the punch in the nose bill. And, and I, I call it the non-discrimination bill, the self-preferencing bill, the, um, I, I don't know why they come up with the titles they do in Congress, but, but it has a long title that, that uh, is meaningless to me. But that bill will probably go uh, through the Senate first and then uh, through the House, so we'll have the language from a Senate. Uh, the, the Senate is much more likely to amend language than the House, and rather than having to uh, have a conference and, and agree on language. Uh, if they go first, uh, their language will be accepted by the House and, and uh, we'll move that bill. But that bill will be uh, a fairly close vote. We, we, we would have a chance of getting to 100 
Republicans on that bill. My, my guess is we probably get to uh, 20 to 30 Republicans on that bill. There, there's, there are some things that could break that, that would open, uh, open that up, and that, that would be uh, uh, very meaningful if we got to that 100, because then there would be some other bills that we might be able to take a look at. Um, and so the, both sides now are starting to ramp up uh, the, the lobbying and the messaging. I, I understand that um, Senator slash Ambassador Brown is now part of a, uh, a group that is starting to ramp up and, uh, on, on the uh, Google side of the world. So um, those are the three bills, I think, that, that move before August. And could, could we talk a little bit more about the last one? So I think it's fabulous that, that you think there's a prospect for significant resource um, uh, improvements for the agencies. I mean, when I was at DOJ, while in oversight hearings, the official line was, you know, when we have more mergers come along and the resources are flat, we just become, we work harder with what we have and are more efficient. But I think, you know, we all recognize that, that there has been a dramatic decline in real resources and that's just got to limit the, the ability of the agencies to bring cases. Um, so I think that's great. Um, and I know the, the state attorneys general are thrilled with the prospect of getting this venue bill. Your own state, of course, being a, a lead in the Google case, the state's case against Google. Um, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the third and, and how you're thinking about, um, assuming we managed to, to get that through Congress and enact it into law, it seems as though it's relying um, really on the court system for enforcement of you know, what it's determined to be kind of self-preferencing or, or discriminatory behavior, um, as opposed to, say, um, you know, a more regulatory solution that, the, that Europe and the UK might be going down in that, in that area. You know, do you worry that, that even if we have terrific legislation that says Congress doesn't want firms to be able to engage in this type of behavior, that it just gets tied up in, in legal battles for you know, the next decade? Um, Microsoft was tied up for decades, or more than a decade. Uh, uh, you know, Ma Bell, you, you, you name it. Um, uh, I think the, the founders designed a system that moves slow so that we don't make hasty mistakes. And, and I do think it's gonna take a while. But I, I fear a regulatory system. There have been some uh, senators who have come up to me and said, Ken, what we really need to do, Republican senators, is form um, an Interstate Transportation Commission. We need to form something for the internet, something for this digital age. Um, I, I don't want that. I don't want government interfering. I want competition between innovators, between actors. And it will take a little while, but I think the end result in, in 10, 15, 20 years is a much better result than having an enforcement body that, and especially in the speech area in this country, um, I think very dangerous for us to uh, decide what, what is dangerous. Uh, you know, the, the, the Democrats didn't believe that the 2016 election was decided uh, fairly. They believed that there was Russian interference. The Republicans, many Republicans, don't believe that the 2020 election was decided fairly. That has to do, I believe, with the, the way that Facebook and, and Twitter and others uh, sort of create this uh, silo because of engagement. They want you to hear from other people that think just like you. Um, what we've done to news organizations in this country is, is a shame. Uh, we don't have uh, as many independent news sources. And so I, I am strongly in favor of trying uh, to work through the competition model rather than uh, the, the uh, government enforcement. And, and do you think the legislation can kind of narrow the scope of what's meant by this enough that, you know, I'm not sure everybody thinks we've got 15 years to settle out, you know, what the role of these dominant tech companies are and if they are disadvantaging some of these entrepreneurs that you heard from in your, in your Boulder hearings? You know, I'm sure they don't think they've got 15 years to go. Like, how, how are you thinking about that tension? I, I totally, as a student of the Interstate Commerce Commission during my early career, I totally get your reservations about adopting that model for the internet, but, or the, the tech world, but how are you thinking about that? Do you, you know, do, are, you, are you comfortable with thinking Congress can write enough specificity into it to give some clarity? So uh, the first thing we do is define uh, who these platforms are. Um, and the, uh, the definition uh, started out including just the four companies I mentioned earlier. 
Um, and, and, you know, uh, one of the uh, lead senators wanted to make sure that we included uh, large Chinese actors uh, also. So the, the threshold came down. Um, uh, Microsoft is now included in that. Some of the Chinese companies are included in that. Um, as it keeps going down, uh, there are more and more companies that end up lobbying against it because they think that threshold, they're going to meet that threshold at some point and, and they, uh, they don't want to be included in that. And so, uh, and they're not, they're not the kind of monopolists that, that we're concerned with with this legislation. So the first uh, uh, challenge is how do you define the platforms that are covered? And the next challenge is how do you define the activity that's covered? And I think the activity is, is fairly specific. The activity involves the um, uh, the, the, the preferencing of your own product. And so uh, there is an App Store bill that would just apply to, to Google and Apple. Um, this bill brings in Amazon because Amazon does a lot of self-preferencing. We've seen uh, a major lawsuit in India. We've seen other countries that, that are very concerned with uh, Amazon seeing a, a, a popular product, copying it, and, and uh, putting it up on its uh, uh, platform and, and dropping the third-party uh, uh, competitor uh, down on the platform. So I, I think that's the, the specific type of activity that this bill would prohibit, um, and it would only apply to a very certain, a very few companies in, in the country. So, so can, can we like expand now from the tech space to this broader antitrust discussion? So one of the, you know, I think one of the themes that we've heard in some of the panels in, in, in today and that are, we're going to hear from tomorrow um, are that um, the, the courts have been imposing kind of increasingly difficult burdens for plaintiffs to meet, particularly government plaintiffs, but, but private ones as well, um, to meet with respect to, say, monopolization cases like the ones that have been brought against Facebook and, and Google um, by both states and the federal government, um, or even just merger control where um, you know, I used to describe it as the, the DOJ has to litigate mergers to monopoly, which just seem on the face of the Clayton Act to be obviously illegal, and yet um, the, the DOJ and the FTC have to go to court to block those because when they say to companies, you know, you can't possibly be proposing to merge to monopoly, the companies say, yeah, we are, and, you know, we'll meet you in court. Um, how, I know that you've, you've spoken at times and in the Third Way report there's a suggestion that perhaps, you know, a agencies have, have created some of these difficulties for themselves. It's not just all coming kind of externally from the court system. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how you're, you're thinking about those issues. Well, I think one of the things we have to do with the agencies is not just have economists. I think we need to have people that have this technical background that understand algorithms, that understand the, um, uh, really the behind the curtain, uh, uh, functions of these uh, tech platforms and, and enabling the uh, the enforcers to be able to go to court and, and succeed. So that's, uh, to me, a fairly, uh, and, and it started, but it really needs to ramp up in a major way if we're going to take on, on uh, these tech companies. Um, I also think that the, uh, the, the resources themselves uh, aren't going to increase by 20% or 30%. They, they, they really need to have a dramatic increase. Uh, the, these four companies, uh, and, and granted, these four companies are fighting enforcers across the world, as they should be, but uh, in, in this country, if we're going to take the lead on, on what are so-called uh, American companies, we need to do it with uh, enforcers that have the power behind them. And, um, you know, if we think about this, this tension of... Um of trying to convince judges that there's a problem. You know, I was interested to hear you say, you know, you started with this very free market approach. Um, I will say I came to economics with that same belief in the competitive system. I was a regulatory, I studied regulation and had the sense that when we get to, to regulation, it means we've somehow failed because we've allowed markets to, to concentrate up to the point where firms have such dominant positions that we can't count on competition to, to um, restrict what they're doing. We have to go to, to government regulation. So I, I had the sense that, that if you believe in the free market, like the most important policy would be a very robust antitrust policy to prevent the accumulation or improper exercise of market power. Um, 
Do you think that there are, outside of the tech space, are there many Republicans who, um, who share kind of that concern and that conviction that if you really, you know, if you love markets, we want to make sure the playing field is really level for those entrepreneurs and, and others that are participating in the markets? No. Is there anything we can do <laughs> to, <laughs> to, help move, to help move people? Or? Yeah, I think uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the Republican Party took a, a turn in, in, in its view of, of uh, uh, market uh, enforcement. And the, the consumer welfare standard uh, took over in a very narrow view, a view I don't think that Milton Freeman or uh, Robert Bork would agree with, but a very narrow view uh, proceeded. And, and I think that it has been used by these companies and other companies um, and promoted by them in a way that uh, many Republicans have bought into. I think the great thing about tech is that a lot of Republicans are now challenging their beliefs and wondering if it doesn't apply here, does it really apply to these other areas? So I'm hoping that, that we'll see some momentum within the Republican Party to address just that. Ultimately, if we don't, if we don't move in a competitive way, we will end up with an enforcement agency. The, the, the thing that scares Republicans more than anything. We didn't want nationalized health care. We certainly don't want nationalized uh, you know, digital platforms. It, it is not a, a uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a cable TV. It is, it is this, uh, it, it, is, it, it, is, it gives us the ability uh, to innovate on such a scale if we don't inhibit it with, with a government. But we set the appropriate bound, as you said, boundaries to, to what those companies can and can't do yeah, I, you know, in I, the promotion I, of competition. You, you think about where we would be with the automobile or with transportation right now if the government were in charge. We would have well-trained horses. We, we would not have, uh, and, and this, this little uh, thingamajig, I always have this in case we don't have a, a flag at my events. <laughs> we can say the Pledge of Allegiance to my phone. So, um, but but this would never be around if government was in charge of the you know the, this this area. In fact, there is a lot of work in economics that suggests that in the U.S. Um, mobile telephony was substantially delayed by FCC regulation and the, the kind of impediments that it created to innovation. So Whatever think, she said was I right. think there are many economists who might agree with you. Um, I know there are certain areas of the economy that, um, that you've thought hard about. Um, you know, in, in, if we think about the debate over competition policy, many people see substantial competitive problems in industries like agriculture, healthcare, pharma, transport. It sounds like some of those you're not maybe as worried about, but, but I think you have spent some time thinking about some of those, and I wondered if you know, you'd like to share some of your thoughts about competition, and you know, is there either more that the agencies could or should be doing, or ways that Congress could, could act to reinforce in some of those spaces? So, um, I'm not an economist, and I've never practiced antitrust law. But I uh, have a little horse sense, and my horse sense tells me that if I aim at four companies, I've got uh, a lot of money coming after me in Washington, D.C. If I aim at 300 companies, I'm never going to get anything done in Washington, D.C. So um, the, the object is to stay focused on big tech. Um, when we get uh, where we need to go with big tech in, in August, um, next January, let's take a look at pharma. Let's take a look at some of these other areas. I don't think we're going to have the same type of bills where we single out a few companies and go after a few companies. Um, but I, I, I do think there are some uh, uh, things that we can do around the edges with some other areas. But if we if we start out, uh, 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 you know, proclaiming to the world that we are going to turn antitrust on its head we will not get anything done in Washington, D.C. because everybody will be against it. So the, the focus right now has to stay on the area that we are. So it's interesting. So I, what I hear you saying is, you know, part of the, the target is driven by your concern that these companies are, you know, not just a competitive problem, but maybe an, an almost existential threat to democracy, maybe exaggerating a bit from where some people are, but maybe that's where it is, but also this more practical or pragmatic political sense that if we could make m m progress in this area, 
maybe that will convince even around the edges some people to move and, and act more. Do you think that's, you know, what do you assess the odds of, of that kind of extension, say, over the following two years to be? Well, uh, I think the important thing is that we, um, we were successful. That what, what these companies are telling every, every other lobbyist in Washington, D.C., is you're next. If this happens, you're next. You can't let this happen to us. We need to make sure it happens because what we're doing in, in this process, it goes beyond just a legislative process. We're really sending a signal to the courts and we're sending a signal to the executive branch and the state attorney generals, you need to get off your duffs and start enforcing this stuff. Um, we're giving you some more tools, but uh, if they stay in the toolbox, they don't do much good. So I, th I think what we're, what we're really trying to do is build momentum. Um, if companies continue to act in other areas in, in ways that are harmful to competition, then maybe Congress, the next Congress, will say, well, this was successful with tech, let's look at it. But um, if, we, if we start in, in, a, two, in, in, in a, a way that's too broad, we will uh, undermine our ability to get anything done. So I've loved talking with you, but I think that there's a whole room full of people who are dying to ask their questions. So why don't I open this up? And I think there are people with mics around. I'm much more comfortable about football than antitrust. But <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like ranching as well might be a, yeah. a topic area. Yeah, Congressman, thank you so much for your, <coughs> your insightful remarks. I just wanted to follow up on the question that Nancy had asked a couple of times, which is to vector <laughs> in on the, the judiciary. Um, as we've heard in a lot of the panels today, you know, there's a lot of talk about beefing up enforcement and resources, but that the federal judiciary really is a roadblock to uh, a shift in antitrust. And most of those judges who are seen as that roadblock were appointed by presidents of your party. And so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how do you reconcile a judicial philosophy that over the last 40 years has really developed a strong skepticism about a lot of the philosophies of antitrust um, with the broader conservative philosophy, whether you see any path to trying to get to the path where you want to go in antitrust with the current judges who are in office. Um, keep that microphone, if you would. I want to ask you a question. Um, this, this is getting to be very unfair here. Uh, so what, what were those judges supposed to do when they have uh, laws that were written in the eight, 1890 and 1914 that had no way they were anticipating e-commerce in those laws? And they had uh, 120 years of judicial precedent that bound them. If well, they, if, go ahead. I was just saying, I mean, to, I mean, there are people in this room who are far more expert than I, but I think what they would say is, in fact, you had decades of judicial precedent that went the other way, and without any change in legislation, a change in judicial precedent in the early 1980s. And so without any legislative change, without any change in congressional intent, I think a lot of those people would say that the sort of last four decades of rulings, in fact, violate the original congressional intent. Um, and that may be right. Uh, I'll say this, that the uh, Congress is acting, Congress is sending a message, and I believe the courts will, uh, to a great extent, uh, accept the message that is being sent and uh, change the path that they have been on the last 40 years. But you think it would take a congressional action in order to force the courts to change the direction that they've been on. And, and so I'm a big, you know, there's a reason that our founders put Article One and Article One. There's a reason they put the legislative branch on the Hill looking down at the White House, um, I believe. Uh, you know, um, and, and I believe it's because, uh, and I believe, and you know where the Supreme Court started out was in our basement. And it should have stayed there. <laughs> But the, uh, I, I believe the courts will take that lead, and I believe the courts will act appropriately. And if they don't, then you're going to have a Congress that's mad and will probably be more uh, uh, motivated to, uh, to continue down this path. I think we have somebody back, oh, somebody back here. Hey, Congressman. Um, I'm Gilad Edelman from Wired. We actually talked like a, I don't know, a year or two years ago. Um, um, so a football question. So or a, fo a football comment and then a question. So in, in the NFL, uh, the team that wins the Super Bowl does not then get 
the top draft pick. In fact, they get the 32nd draft pick, and the worst team gets the top one because it's a lot more fun. It's a much more compelling product when you when whoever's winning the competition doesn't then get a leg up, and whoever is losing sort of does. Um, and this seems very intuitive, and it's this kind of red-blooded all-American game. Uh, this is an academic conference, so there's no, you know, there's a couple Republicans here. Can you, I'm just like, could you, um, <laughs> I just want to know more about the conversations you have. I mean, Nancy asked you, you know, do, do, do your Republican colleagues see the need for more vigorous antitrust enforcement in markets beyond tech? And you said no. I would love you for you to flesh that out because I, like, I'm trying to understand the right wing mindset that says, oh, yeah, it's good that two companies control this whole industry. So wh what do you think the, the perspective is there that can reconcile the other elements of contemporary conservative philosophy with markets that are dominated by a tiny handful of companies? Well, let me let me start by saying uh, I obviously don't agree with uh, everything my some of my Republican colleagues agree with, um, or I wouldn't be in, in the position I'm in right now concerning big tech. Um, having had conversations with probably 80 to 90 members on these big tech bills, uh, the, the the big fear among conservatives in this country is that the federal government has gotten too big. And, and just as a, a, a big monopoly gets slow and eventually gets overtaken by smaller, um, more uh, uh, agile uh, business actors, um, we're concerned that the federal government is doing too much. We had a, a system that was designed to give the states power and, and the federal government power. The federal government is, is in education. The federal government is in all these areas that really the states are better suited to handle. So by giving the federal government more authority over business, over this area, the conservative fear is that we slow down the economy, that we slow down innovation, that, that uh, you know, we, we fall behind our uh, worldwide competitors. Now, I disagree with that in some areas. Um, in, in obviously in tech, I disagree with that because I think what we have to do is we have to out innovate um, in order to uh, stay competitive. Um, I, I don't know about some of the other areas, and, and my focus has been here. If if I determine, and if I'm fortunate enough to get reelected, and I determine that. Uh, you know, there is a, a problem in the airline industry, a problem in, in banking, whatever, then uh, absolutely I'd want to take a look at that. But I think uh, if we can be successful here, we can prove to Republicans that there is a role for enforcement, and, and that's uh, really the, the issue. So, you got Congress, uh, okay, Congressman. Wait, well, oh. Can I, yeah, I had Sebastian over here, so go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry, think, Philippe. I have a, a question on how do you think about the balance between public and private enforcement of these laws? Like, so uh, one of the major traits of U.S. antitrust has always been that private enforcement is very strong as it complements the public enforcement at all, and private enforcement has been going down a lot because of a lot of judicial decisions and, and changes. And if you make a parallel, for example, with private privacy legislation, one of the main blocks is the distinction whether uh, private parties are going to allow to litigate privacy violations or not. So I wonder how much this comes up in the antitrust discussions as well, whether this is a similar block and a distinction between the Democrat and the Republican Party, and, uh, and what are your views on like how should be the, what is the ideal role for private parties in litigation versus the attorney generals or the, or the FTC and the DOJ in this area? Thank you. Yeah, uh, you just opened up another can of worms. <laughs> so uh, there, there's, one, one of the realities in, in DC is uh, the trial lawyers are over here, and the small businesses are over here. And if you're, uh, uh, if you're in favor of, of private enforcement, you're helping the trial lawyers. And I don't believe that. Um, I, I think, and, and we just passed a great arbitration bill uh, with 116 Republican votes. Um, it basically prohibited uh, a forced uh, mandatory arbitration uh, for cases involving allegations of sexual assault or, or sexual harassment. Um, I had to fight like heck to convince my fellow Republicans that that was not a gift to the trial lawyers, that was actually standing with victims of crime. So if you use the right lingo, you get people um, on board. 
what we have to do in, in this area, again, is to talk about, you know, I have a, a lady in, uh, near Boulder. She's coming up, doesn't Yeah. Um, but she invented a jump rope. She's the, they call her the jump rope queen. And she invented a jump rope and got a bunch of patents and the patents have been taken away by PTAB. And I have to make her the, the face of competition as opposed to um, a, a group of trial lawyers. And so that's, that's my job is to make sure that I'm appealing to Republicans, to conservatives on a level that uh, they can relate to. And so, um, using the term private enforcement brings up images of, of trial lawyers using the, uh, the lady who uh, uh, got her uh, patent uh, ripped away from her by this group that has been uh, set up by these major companies um, is something that we'll be able to move forward. So a lot of it is just how, how we market uh, uh, this idea. Congressman, can you talk a bit about the uh maybe take us inside some of the the day-to-day -day process of where like, it just feels like there's a lot of money being spent on the other side to uh, to take out the the self-preferencing bill to slow it down or whatever and um, you know how does it compare to other lobbying efforts you've seen are there any anecdotes that you can share about sort of the experience or, or uh, arguments you've heard on the other side or you know uh, ads or uh, just things that you're hearing in the hallways. I'm just really curious about the process. Sure. So I, I think, uh, Luther, the, um, these companies have, have easily spent in the last couple of years $100 million. Um, foundations, other groups on the right side, on the left side. Um, I, I feel like when we pass this bill, I want to go to these CEOs and tell them, I could have lost this for you for $50 million. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can spend a $100 million, you can spend $150 million on this. This is the right thing to do. And at some point, members of Congress will do the right thing. And uh, the, the, the talk behind the scenes, I mean, I, I go up to people and I say, look, you know, got to get this bill done. Uh, what Amazon's doing is terrible. Ken, I've got an Amazon facility going in my district. I don't really care. You, you, you're a United States congressman. You're not a congressman for this hometown. You've got to look at this in a, in a broader sense. And so um, I think that we're able to convince people with this bill that uh, we can uh, overcome a very limited interests. And, and that's really what the, the, is going on behind the scenes are uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why I don't know if Democrat leadership's against us. I mean, it, it, it's, it's Fascinating if you look at um, these companies and the children of leaders that they've hired. I don't know how many of you have seen these, these, but there's a whole lot of kids who are working for these companies who have last names that you wouldn't be surprised to hear. Um, I'll put it that way so I can go back to DC next week. <laughs> Uh, but you know they they have they have a multi-pronged strategy, and so I'm not sure whether these bills we passed our our uh, bills out of committee last June. It's almost a year now, and they haven't moved to the floor. Um, we've we've probably named 200 post offices and not dealt with a single antitrust bill on on the floor of the House. Um, and and I think that w what we're going to end up doing is. Uh, we may be moving these bills after everybody's primaries are over and uh, avoiding that issue in, in a primary. I'm, I'm hoping there is some strategy like that. Um, I don't get to sit in on the uh, Democrat leadership meeting, so I'm not sure if that's it, but I do think that uh, the, there will be a sweet spot in July where these bills could move with minimal uh, harm to a lot of members that, that are trying to win, win their seats. Hey, uh, co Congressman, uh, Matt Soler, it's a, it was great to hear. Oh, you. good yeah. to see you, man. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you notice I worked in the Boston Tea Party? Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I read that. It was your work. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, the famine, that was um, I mean, it's always weird to be like, oh, that was great, because if it was a famine, it was terrible, but like, yeah, it's, it's a great story. Um, so uh, your work is really important, and I mean, 
I, I want to just kind of frame this by pointing out, I think actually just the, the judges, the judicial problem, people love to blame uh, conservatives. It was a bipartisan thing. Stephen Breyer was an important figure in authoring, in narrowing antitrust. So just, just want to point that out. Um, but I have a, a question, like, as kind of both parties are scrambled, right, over the last couple of years, very strange things are happening with both political coalitions. What happened a couple of weeks ago when uh, this, is, this is not about antitrust, but it is about big tech. Uh, in Staten Island, someone, uh, Chris Smalls, organized an Amazon warehouse. And I'm kind of curious what kind of discussions, if any, this has kind of prompted among Republicans about, you know, because clearly Republicans have, uh, don't like unions or have traditionally not liked uh, unions, but this is Amazon and I saw, you know, a bunch of conservatives saying nice things about that. So I'm kind of wondering what conversations you've heard about that. Uh, I, I, I haven't, uh, honestly. I, by the way, I love police unions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but Matt, I, I haven't heard much about that. I, I know they, uh, uh, the, the unions tried to organize another Amazon facility and, and it didn't pass, and then they did, they did organize that one. I, I don't know what impact that's gonna have in terms of how this plays out. It, it, is, it is sort of moving on a parallel track. Um, it, you know, Amazon makes the argument that the unions are going after us because we're so generous with our benefits that they, uh, you know, we're undermining their argument that only uh, unions can provide these kind of benefits. I, I, I have no idea. Uh, w w from, from my perspective, it doesn't matter. My, my arguments on these bills have, have remained the same uh, regardless of whether uh, there is a union effort or not. Anyone else? Uh, Congressman, uh, I'm Luis Zingales. So first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, it was, was great, your speech and your sense of humor. Really, I appreciate that. Um, but uh, as a student of uh, political economy, we're very curious to know uh, what works and what doesn't. You have this uh, very inspiring view that if, there's, if this is the right thing, Congress will do it. Uh, as academics, we're a little bit more skeptical about this. And we'd like to understand, from a research point of view, uh, what is the thing that uh, you see as most dangerous, and what is the thing that are least dangerous? And uh, in particular, how do you see the role that academics play in favoring or opposing this lobbying? Well, I, I have to tell you, I'm just as skeptical as ac of academics as you are of politicians. So. <laughs> um, um, I, so I, I, I think that um, in, in this country, we have a number of very interesting um, uh, sort of uh, thought silos. And one of them are academics, and one of them are politicians. And, and the media, I think, um, the, the newspapers have been getting bashed by Google and Facebook and, and the, the uh, compensation on, on advertising. And they have taken up this cause. And I think that, in, in, to a certain extent, that the Wall Street Journal's uh, series on Facebook and, and the impact on, on teenage girls had a lot of, uh, and then there's this Netflix social dilemma. Is that, is that the name of it? Yeah. Did I get it right? Yeah, um, that, that had a lot of impact. So I think you're getting all sorts of groups that are coming to the same conclusion around the same time that are convincing people. In other words, if we were fighting each other right now, people would be, uh, um, hesitant to make a strong decision like this. But because they're getting reinforced in so many different areas, I think that uh, this is uh, really uh, very successful. I, I asked my friends, um, uh, Matt and, and Luther and, and others, not to say publicly that they like me, because I'll lose a primary <laughs> if they say that. But um, if we can just keep, and I'm sure the camera wasn't on for that, if we can just keep that um, on the down low, uh, th that'll be fine. But I, I do think that uh, this, you know, we have uh, very liberal California members of the House and very conservative California members of the House um, fighting these bills because they're from California, not because they are from 
uh, not because of their political ideology. I think that uh, that also applies to our side, people who are supporting the bills, liberal, conservative, different areas of the country. So um, I do believe that it, it's important that academics, um, the, the media, uh, the, the film industry, and others, as they portray uh, this accumulation of wealth in, in its honest terms, I, I think it's going to be very helpful uh, reinforcing the public view. Politics is, is, uh, is downstream from uh, public opinion. And, and as we uh, all talk about this more, public opinion is going to gel and, and politics will react. Hi, Congressman John Sands from Knight Foundation. Uh, you just mentioned public, public opinion, and Knight Foundation uh, partners with Gallup to do public opinion polling on a lot of these issues. Um, fairly recently, we, we released a report that found that uh, almost seven in 10 Americans don't think that, uh, don't think that, that our elected officials uh, have any credibility on these issues. They don't, they don't trust um, uh, Congress t to be able to act. And so I'm, I'm curious to know how, how uh, how you're thinking about closing that gap among your colleagues? Like, how do, how do you how do you try to move the 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 the, um, the needle on trust among the American people? And is, is that an opinion on on antitrust specifically, or just generally? On on tech issues generally, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a great you know the, the I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, I, I started in elected office as a district attorney. And I, uh, we got these great convictions, and nothing, none of it hit the newspaper. So I went to my local newspaper, and I said, what's going on here? And, and the publisher said to me, Ken, it's like this. A plane leaves LaGuardia every day and lands in LAX. We don't write a story about that. The one that crashes in the cornfield in Iowa, that's the one we write the story about. We are not going to get um, the public to believe that we're doing something until we do something. And, and I think this is an area that has high enough visibility that we can do something. But what the, what the media wants to cover are the food fights. They want to cover the, the, you know, the, the vote that uh, passes by two votes. Um, they want to cover Joe Manchin objecting to Joe Biden. They want to cover um, the, 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 the sort of things that, that have sex appeal. That's, that's how they sell advertising. Um, uh, one, I. Don't want to insult anybody here, but this isn't a very high sex appeal area. <laughs> antitrust, there haven't been many films that have been created on antitrust. But um, it, if we do this, I think, it's a, uh, I think we will move the needle a little bit where the public will say, you know, we've got some faith. That, I mean, we, we, you know, when we come together behind Ukraine. We come together behind a lot of things, um, and, and nobody really says, oh, that's great that they're working together. This is an area where I think people really scratch their head and say, why, why? how did this happen that, um, you know, David Cicilline and Ken Buck are, are different people. Um, I, I wouldn't be comfortable, uh, you know, in, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and he wouldn't be comfortable in, in Greeley, Colorado. And that's just, that's just a reality. He's the one that, that made the motion to uh, uh, throw Trump out of office on the 25th Amendment because he was uh, incapable of, of, you know, mentally incapable of, of serving. Um, and, and so when I go to my friends and say, you know, we've got to support this bill, and they say, but, but David's on it. It's kind of like, yeah, but we, we agree on this. We don't agree on a lot, but we agree on this. And, and I think that's what we have to convince people of is let's find the common ground. I'm not going to agree with you on guns, but, but we can agree on antitrust. I think we have time for maybe one more question over here. Thank you, Congressman. You're, you're sandwiched in between Assistant Attorney General Cantor and, and Chairwoman Khan in terms of our agenda. We haven't talked much about the White House and the administration. What are you looking for from the FTC, from the Justice Department, from the Biden White House right now that's supportive of your agenda? Um, what, I'm, what I'm hoping they will do is not talk to Republicans <laughs> and, and talk to a whole lot of Democrats. Um, I, I will not get um, a lot of support if there's a picture with Ken Buck and Joe Biden, you know, thumbs up, we're, we're moving forward on antitrust bills. Um, I think it will uh, uh, benefit the Democrats. I think it will benefit the Republicans. But uh, the, the people that I have reached out to 
uh, are uh, the Bill Bars of the world, are the, the folks who have credibility on our side to talk about, this isn't big government, guys. This is, this is something we need to do to create competition, to restore competition uh, to the marketplace. And I have to tell you, it's funny because every once in a while there'll, there'll be a press release from either uh, Chairman Cicilline or the White House, and they'll say, we need to punish these companies. And I go, oh, I just lost five votes. <laughs> Don't talk about punishing companies. We're creating competition. And it's just a language uh, that, that you know, is, is different on each side. But um, I, I, I think, that, and I'll tell you something that would be very helpful. Um, and I get, I, get, oh, I get bruises all over from these. Um, uh, when the chairwoman talks about using antitrust um, in relation to climate change, um, in relation to labor issues, in relation to uh, other issues that are, it, that are speaking to her constituency or the, or the White House's constituency, um, I've got a lot of explaining to do on my side. And, and so I'm telling them, you know, that, that they're just doing that. That's, that's not what they're going to do with this legislation. They're, they've they've got to talk to their base, just like we talk to our base, but uh, what we're really trying to do is create competition in this this area, and so I, I think it's uh, it's important. And, 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 and Chairman Cicilline has been great, and I've tried to be great. I'm not as good as he is at dialing it back because my mouth just wanders. But um, if if we all stay on message for the next few months, we're going to get some bills passed. Is there one? All right. You got I got all night, by the way. I don't care. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanted to abuse my, my organizer privilege to ask a, a question about something we didn't speak, which was the report that the, the committee organized and put out. And I wanted to ask, so what was the, when did you decide to write the report, and what was the main motivation behind it? Was it like a fact-gathering exercise? Was it an agenda-setting exercise? Was it a combination of everything? And then, and then in the end, you, you, left, you, you had like a kind of descent to on the, some of the conclusions and how was this process internally as well, discussing and, and organizing the, that part, you know, which is, I think people talk less about it, but it was incredibly influential and it's not that long ago as well. I, I need to ask you a question. You're talking about the report that came out in uh, October of 2020? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then I wrote a, a, what I call the third way report? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so it, again, uh, it's politics. I'm, I'm, I wish I could be an academic and, and you know, have a pure life, but I don't. I, I am in politics. And October 2020, there happened to be an election coming up that was pretty important to people at the beginning of November. And so the Democrats come up with this report, and if, we, if it is a bipartisan report, um, it looks uh, to the world as if the Democrats are great leaders and they're going to take, you know, this great leadership position and it helps Biden. If I write a third-way report um, agreeing with them, but not signing on to their report, it doesn't give them as much momentum. So I was asked by my leadership to not join their report, but uh, if I wanted to do something, to write a separate report. So uh, not, not you know, exactly what I wanted to do. I think that, that uh, but there were some things that, that uh, uh, David included in that that I disagreed with. So, so the third way report made some sense, but again, the timing of releasing something in October is, uh, uh, is a tense time to to uh, to do something like that, and so that that's why they timed it the way they did, and and it's why I, I went and did a third way report. And that's why we're hoping you've identified that sweet spot this summer for perhaps getting legislation through, which does seem a very important part of the process. So thank you. I found this an extraordinarily interesting conversation, as I think our audience did, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking the congressman for his remarks. Even with more optimism than I good. <laughs> That's my job. Uh, yes, well, I certainly hope so. You're Thank you. It's work. good to meet it's you. Really nice to meet you.